back to our machine learning session. Our presentation is about to begin. Uh, my name is Mirella Damien and I teach computer science here at Europa. And it is my greatest pleasure today to introduce our speakers. Um, we still wait. So uh, here from uh, right to left, uh, we have uh, Sarah Mathison. She is uh, from Swarthmore College. She is a VCG assistant professor in the computer science department. Uh, then we have Rika uh, Daniels. She is from uh, Distillery, coming from New York. She's a data scientist. And last but not least, we have uh, Sima Thomas. She's a director, project manager, and global business manager at SAP here in Newtown Square. And uh, she's also an adjunct faculty here at Villanova. So um, I am very excited to have them here to share their insights and experiences with us. Uh, just a few quick words about the format of the session. Each speaker is going to give a brief presentation, uh, followed by questions. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to ask. But I would kindly ask you to uh, raise your hand and um, introduce yourself and direct a question to one of the three speakers. And please keep it brief, just to give a chance to everyone to ask their questions. So um, welcome, and uh, without uh, any further ado, Sarah. Thank you. <coughs> I really wanted to thank uh, Marilla for inviting me, and I'm really excited to be here and see so many people um, uh, come to this session. Um, so I want to give a little bit of an overview of what is machine learning and go over some of the different types of methods that people use in machine learning. Okay, all right, I'll try to speak louder. I'm kind of losing my voice. Um, is this okay? Okay, so um, I want to give you an overview of the types of problems that we think about in machine learning. And uh, then Kima and Reka and myself as well will give some examples um, from different fields. So please just yeah, stop me if you have any questions um, and uh, we'll keep it moving. Okay, so when we think about what is machine learning, we're often trying to get a computer to actually learn something from an existing data set. And I like to kind of start off from the idea of how do we as humans actually learn. And I think if, you know, we think about when we are children and we learn, um, you know, we can show a child um, a picture of a ball and they'll know that every, all, the, all other balls are all the balls. And we can show uh, a car or um, a giraffe in this case. And the child will know, even if they don't see giraffes very often, that all these other things are also giraffes, even if they're in very different contexts. So how could we actually get a computer to do the same thing? Um, so what we'd really like is to be able to show a computer a bunch of pictures of giraffes and say, OK, the computer knows that's a giraffe. So this is not so bad if in a world where there are only giraffes. Um, but what if the problem is a little bit more complicated? Um, so this is the classic um, bagel v. dog uh, problem. And you can see how, um, <laughs> you know, we can sort of, you know, it's even maybe hard for us to say what, which is which. Um, but a computer would be very, very, um, this would be very difficult for a computer. And so I think that we're not only thinking about how to identify objects, but how to distinguish between objects that might be very similar. And so I think when we think about machine learning, we're often thinking about this problem of what we call classification. So how can we identify an object and sort of classify it into um, one, of these, one of these categories? Um, and so in, in a lot of uh, machine learning applications, you sort of hear these words like classification or even different training examples that you're trying to separate into different um, so, you know, this is great uh, in, this, in this one example. This is sort of fun, but, you know, why do we care that we can distinguish bagels from dogs? Um, so there are some examples um, that I wanted to go through of how machine learning is in our daily lives. And one of the earliest um, ways that machine learning made it into um, kind of common use is email filtering. Um, so this is, you know, spam versus ham. What do I really want and what do I get, you know, in my, in my inbox? And this was one of the earliest applications of machine learning. Um, another one that you may be familiar with is handwriting recognition. So if you're depositing a check at the ATM or you know, even on your phone, and it's you know, the scrawled handwriting of how much the check amount is for, you know, usually it gets it right. And that's also a machine learning application um, that is pretty remarkable, actually. Um, uh, machine learning is actually making its way into uh, detecting issues in commercial flights. And um, one of the uh, growth areas of machine learning is in medical applications. So can we actually uh, dis distinguish between, say, a scan for um, a tumor that ends up being benign 
or malignant. And so I think these examples um, kind of highlight the, the strengths of machine learning and some of the ways in which it's improving our lives. Okay, so um, I think kind of a little bit broader even, there's the data now is just too big um, for humans to really make sense of it. And I think that this is not going to change in the future. We have more and more data in every field, and really humans can no longer uh, process and make sense of this data. So there's no going back. And I think that it will be, um, as uh, Karen in the keynote said, increasingly valuable to actually understand what's happening. And I think sometimes people think of machine learning algorithms as magic or these buzzwords. And I really want to sort of unravel that and say that you know we can understand them and make sense of them. Um, and I sort of like this quote, this is a little bit more about um, programs in general which we use all the time, right? We use programs on our phones and our computers, um, but we really need to develop that sort of understanding of what they're doing. And I think machine learning, increasingly many programs have a machine learning component right now. And if we're not able to understand that, we're always going to be on the user end and we're never going to be on the creation end. And I think that it's essential that we are. Um, okay, so. Uh, Without further ado, some terminology for machine learning that we're going to see throughout all of our talks. Um, so training uh, versus testing. So I'd say machine learning is typically in these two phases. So we're working with some training data. So these are often examples that are known. So in the case where a human has gone through and perhaps very tediously labeled, OK, that's spam, that's ham, spam, ham, spam, ham. And they've gone through all of these things, and there's a true answer or a true label to these questions. Um, and the computer is going through this training process and actually trying to learn from this. So you should think of the training as the actual learning. When people say training, they mean learning. Um, and then testing, we can think about this as a form of prediction. So now we've seen all these examples where we knew the true answer. If we see another example coming in, how can we actually say, OK, that was a dog or that was a bagel? So I'm, I want to make a prediction. So in this phase, we're kind of trying to classify a new example. Okay. And uh, secondly, you may hear um, these terms a lot, supervised versus unsupervised uh, machine learning. And so when we're talking about supervised learning, that's the context, um, this is the context in which I, uh, all the examples have been so far. So examples where there's some labeled data. So someone has gone through and actually labeled these data sets. And this is often a little easier because you have something to work from. It's almost like, you know, a teacher has taught you you know, these are all quadratic equations or something like that. And then you have another uh, equation come up in the exam and you can say, okay, I knew it's a quadratic equation because I learned all these other ones. Um, unsupervised learning is more, um, I think a little bit maybe how we learn as children. So maybe people don't tell us, you know, that's a person and that's a dog, but we kind of figure it out implicitly. It's often a little bit more difficult, this idea of unsupervised learning, because we don't have any training examples. And we may, see, we may think, okay, you can learn nothing in the unsupervised case because you don't have any training data coming in. That's actually not exactly true. And I think unsupervised learning is one of the fields that's really growing because it's too difficult to hand label all of these training examples. Any questions so far? All right. Um, so let's get into the machine learning methods after we have this terminology. Um, and I think that when people say machine learning, they often think about, you know, it has to be fancy or it has to be new or something like that. But I think that really machine learning is grounded in regression. And um, in this type of problem, you have some, you know, dependent uh, or independent variable X, some dependent variable Y, and you're trying to create some model, right? We've learned that roughly these data points fall on this line. So we can actually then do prediction. And, you know, so we don't often think about um, you know, regression is often seen in the statistical context, but it can be used for a prediction as well. And many machine learning algorithms are a flavor of regression. So if I see some new data point coming in, um, x here, I can say, okay, well, I think roughly that's going to be the y value. So I don't know what the y value is, but I can actually make a prediction. So this is for some continuous variable. But often in machine learning, we want to do something more discrete. So we want to have certain classes. So we also think about logistic regression and how do we actually create a classifier um, for regression. And so here's an example where this is the number of hours spent studying for an exam and this is uh, your probability of passing the exam. So passing is binary. You either passed or you didn't. Um, so that's why the data points are all, you know, they're all on one. These people all passed and these people all didn't. 
So these are our training examples. These are other people who have taken the exam. So now I want to think, okay, so how, how much should I study to get you know, a decent probability of passing the exam? And so maybe I decide to study for two hours, and I have a 25% chance of passing the exam. So you know, this is maybe um, not great, but this is how I decided to do it. And um, this is an example of where you're actually learning and predicting from binary data, right? So we had two classes, path and not, and we actually learned, um, we learned how to distinguish them. <coughs> um, okay, so kind of moving on uh, into this classification regime, there's uh, more sophisticated methods that you may have uh, heard these words, the support vector <coughs> machine, and um, this is sort of thinking about uh, higher dimensional data. So here, all of our data are uh, two-dimensional. They have an x and a y coordinate. And the green points versus red points have all been labeled. So someone has gone through and actually labeled all of these points. And they're, they're, the, the idea is that we want to create some sort of boundary between these two classes. And we want to create the boundary that best separates um, our examples. Um, and this is often called this hyperplane is separating hyperplane. Um, <coughs> and in this case, we came up with this one. And it does a pretty good job. There's you know, this green point that's sort of an outlier. But overall, we're doing a pretty decent job of sort of separating these classes. And um, this method requires you know, a lot of math and um, training in, in that example. Um, but then, if we have another data point coming in, um, we can say, OK, if our data point was over here, I'm going to say, OK, I predict that it will be the red the red class. Um, so you should think about this, you know, cat versus dog or something like that, right? You're trying to predict um, these outcomes. Um, so what if we didn't have this sort of training data? So getting into this sort of unsupervised uh, case. So in, in, that, in that case, we may not know what, our, what the labels are of any of the points. Um, but we're still trying to create this sort of structure or identify this structure in the data. Um, so in this example, um, I started out by sort of randomly choosing the clusters, right? So I've clustered all these red points, and I've clustered all these blue points. But these don't really look like very good clusters, right? It doesn't really look like I'm actually separating the data here. Um, and so what this uh, particular algorithm is, this is k-means, actually, if, if, you've, uh, if you've heard of it. Um, what this does is sort of iteratively try to update these cluster memberships until we get convergence. Um, and so the next picture, um, we shift these, these are the averages of the cluster. So this big red point is the average of this cluster, and this blue point is the average of that cluster. We try to update those gradually. Um, and we can kind of keep doing this and going through these steps. And finally, we sort of get something that looks reasonable. So the algorithm itself has learned that there's these two different clusters, this red cluster and blue cluster. So those were not labeled beforehand. Um, and I think this is really um, where a lot of machine learning is going, because we just have the data coming in. Can we, can we cluster it into two groups or three groups, four groups, and actually sort of make sense of the data, even without any labels? Um, so this is, I think, where, where a lot of things are going. Um, and finally, um, some recent uh, trends in uh, machine learning. Um, have you heard of deep learning? Anyone? A few people? Yeah. So this is kind of uh, becoming more and more popular. And um, I'll, I'll go through that a little bit just to kind of try to demystify it. So um, I would say recent trends are trying to focus more and more on deep learning. And so what do we mean by deep learning? So deep learning was inspired by the way that neurons are connected in our brains. Um, and that maybe we, as humans, have a very nuanced model of learning with many sort of layers. You know, we can look at the room and we can automatically kind of take in a lot of information um, in layers. And deep learning actually was, um, people have been trying to do this for over 20 years. I think all, over 30 years now, since the 1980s. And they were very unsuccessful at first at doing deep learning. Um, and breakthroughs recently in the, the amount of data that we have to make deep learning work, and also the type of um, sort of pre-processing of the data have really made this feasible. So I'll try to go through examples. Um, so this is an image, uh, image processing example. And say we have these, um, these faces, and we want to know something about them. Um, so maybe whether the person was wearing glasses in this photo, 
or whether they were smiling, something like that. And you can kind of think about this as linked to this Facebook tagging recognition, right? So if you ever posted a picture on Facebook and it was, you know, do you want to tag your mom or something like that? You're like, how did you know that it was my mom? Well, they've already seen a lot of examples of, of, of that image of that person. And so that's what they're actually learning from those training examples. So it's very related to that. So maybe we don't, um, we don't want to know what, who the person was, but maybe something about, about them. And what people wanted to do was develop this multi-layer network of learning, so layers of learning of features. And they wanted to try and take this input data and do this type of prediction. And this was, and people just really struggled with this. They couldn't get this to work. Um, so I'll try to go through the pre-processing phase that actually made this work. So the first step in uh, deep learning is that we'll sort of unravel the image into a, a, a vector of pixels. So there's the very, the, the pixel bounds. And, and we were, we're going to get rid of the thing we actually wanted to know about. We are, we're not going to care about that. We're actually going to do this unsupervised um, learning to start. And what we're trying to do is try to find a dimensionality reduction, or reduce the dimension of our images um, in this first step. And this is this deep network idea, so multiple layers. When people say deep learning, all they really mean is lots of layers of learning. And so the idea is to sort of do a dimensionality reduction and then reconstruct the data. And people were really amazed to find that what they came out with this first sort of hidden layer, what, what these first features were, they kind of look like edges. It's very, it's very sort of coarse, but they, they were, the computer was actually learning that images are made up of edges. And then if we uh, stitched all the edges together, we would actually be able to make these, um, these pictures. And this is without any labels, right? This is completely unsupervised. And even more sort of amazingly, so the next layer, we're going to train the next layer. So we're going to throw away all this stuff. We're going to use this as the input, this new feature representation. No longer pixels. We're going to use edges. And we're going to try to do this again to train the next layer. And people were even more amazed to find that higher level features came out of this. So now we're not just looking at just edges, but actual parts of the face. So mouth and eyes and nose and so on. And so these are the computer is kind of learning that faces are made up of these building blocks. And then you could keep doing that, right? You could kind of keep going deeper and deeper. But this is where the deep comes from, this multiple layer. And so we can throw this away now. And now we're in a much better position to actually identify these things that we really wanted to know about our data in the first place. So if we want to know if someone's wearing glasses, we will look at the eye feature. And if we want to know if someone's smiling, we're going to look at the mouth feature. And so really the computer has done all of this feature learning on its own and been able to identify these. And then, then we're in a much better position for our classification class. And so kind of putting this all together, this is what I would say a deep learning network looks like. And there are many different types of them um, now. But it's, if we had a new example coming in after we've done the training, we could predict, we could feed the data through this network and actually make a prediction, either about who the person is or whether they're smiling. Um, so this is kind of deep learning in, in a nutshell. And um, I just wanted to give some uh, final thoughts about machine learning. So in general, uh, machine learning is very good at sort of echoing these patterns in our training data or kind of giving us back um, some of the things that were in our training data. And I think one thing that we need to be careful of in the future is that we're not just having the data echo back our biases to us. And um, I think that we need to be careful about this in applications where um, machine learning is making decisions about humans um, and things that affect our lives. So I, I would caution that machine learning is, it, it right now, only as good as the training data. Um, and uh, on, on the uh, opposite mm -hmm. side, or sort of a more optimistic side, um, AlphaGo is a program to play Go. I don't know if you've uh, ever played it. I've never played it, actually. But there's programs that play chess and Go, and they're actually better than humans now. And in particular, AlphaGo um, actually learned different strategies that humans had never used before. And I think that that's actually, um, you know, Go is just a game. But uh, it, it gives us hope, I think, for the future that 
algorithms will actually be able to maybe uncover things that humans didn't see. And maybe they can also help um, correct for some of our implicit sort of human biases. And I wanted to end on this um, self-driving cars example um, because I think that this is one example where the, the benefits will be really universal and um, in terms of safety and also in terms of access for people who aren't able, to, uh, who don't have access to transportation or driving themselves. And this is all um, machine learning and actually deep learning in particular. So given a lot of examples of here's a car, here's a person, um, here's a cat crossing the road, you know, the car will be able to learn from all these examples and be able to know the right thing to do in, in those situations. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll take some questions and then we'll transition into the next part of our talk. Um, thank you. I'm going to ask a very selfish question. I have a project right now I'm working on. I have to take three form job titles and map them. And I've been wondering if something like machine learning is the right direction to go with that. Do you have, I mean, that's a very high level description, but can you comment on that? Uh, sure. So do you have any examples where you've gone through and said, here are the categories, or yes or no, or whatever the yeah, outcome and I'm, is. Well, I'm thinking that that, yeah. that would be the first step yeah, if this yeah. is the approach that I take. Yes, yeah. I think in that case you would probably want um, some sort of supervised approach because you really want to be a little bit more confident about the outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that would be, you know, but to get the training data, um, it, it can be it can be tedious and you would like, yeah it seems like that's the hard like again I'm thinking about how, how am I going to do this and it right, seems like right, that's right, the hard right, part right. and I guess I in my mind I'm kind of like yeah I don't really want to do that there's got to be a better way but I keep coming back to, <laughs> to like this may be what I have to do right 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 um, so you could get an undergrad um, <laughs> um, or one other option is Amazon um, Mechanical Turk I don't know if you've um, heard of this but you actually uh, you crowdsource the problem. So these are actual humans that are getting paid, and you would have to pay them, um, to, to label the data, and that will give you your training data. So I know a lot of people have done that successfully, but I'd say you need at least at least 100 examples. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if not more, to make yeah. it successful. You could try a raw clustering approach, like this sort of unsupervised style, um, but it may not give you the clusters that you're looking for. Like maybe you know what the clusters are, and that would probably be a better approach. But it should definitely be possible. Thank you. Maybe I could address that. There, are, there could be smaller applications that may be available on platforms that could do what you need to do to learn the patterns and spit out the results on the other side. There are not many products that are available on the market right now, but I'll, I'll share in my part, there are organizations that are working on creating that platform where you have these algorithms and you can provide an input in terms of data, and then provide guidance in terms of what output you're looking at, so you're not writing the algorithm yourself. So, so you are actually applying that to your day-to-day -day environment, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, how you're doing that for business world. Just a few questions, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned something that was Surprised me how our biases could be reflected by the machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, that's true for supervised learning uh, only. Uh, oh, yes, yeah. Because like, yes, yes. it can't be incorporated in the mathematical model or anything. It's just the, the training data that we, that we provide, we label it based on our own view of it, right? Right, right, it, right, right, right. And so I think there are things that we can do to overcome that. and. So one, so one kind of hypothetical example, um, say a college is having too many admissions, too many um, applications, and they want to use machine learning to try and you know, do a first pass. And so say they um, select current students that have, uh, say, done well at the college and not done well at their examples. And so they want more, they want to admit more students that kind of seem like the students that did well. Um, so if Though historically, um, say more men had gone to this uh, college than women, then um, the the data itself would sort of be unbiased, uh, or so be biased, 
and then um, towards that. And then if you have a, a new set of applications coming in, the algorithm will try to make the sort of incoming class look as similar to the sort of existing student population as, as it does. And so it may be, you know, if you're sort of naively applying the machine learning algorithm, um, it, it may not give you quite the results that you want. And actually one um, research area in machine learning is to have balanced training, class, training classes. So say even if, um, and another example is say in cancer, we may see lots and lots of scans that are uh, totally healthy and benign. We may only see a few that people have cancer. Um, and that creates imbalances. So that's more likely that a new scan coming in, they'll say, oh, you don't have cancer. So it's really, really important to have those balanced training classes, even if the um, actual numbers in the population are very imbalanced. So I think in general, to try and keep your, your training data as balanced as possible is extremely important. Um, and so there are things you can do with the training data coming in. You can filter out data so that you get balanced classes. It's, it's really um, essential. Um, so I think that's one thing that we can do. There, are, there is actually work um, coming out of Haverford, actually, about how to even go further with that and remove some of the implicit biases in the data, especially for historical data that you don't want that to just be the future, right? You know, we think of, oh, machine learning is predicting the future. Well, actually, it's just predicting the past. And so I think that that's something we have to think a lot about. So there are actually algorithmic ways we can sort of correct for these things. Yeah. Yes. How does machine learning relate to AI? Because it seems like they have a lot of similarities and overlap. Right, right. I'd say it's in some ways it's almost a rebranding. Um, but I think there are differences. So I mean, artificial intelligence, um, I think that has been around for a lot longer. And I think historically that has been um, a little bit more on constructing things like say, uh, decision trees. So a patient comes in and you want to decide what, what, what disease they have. They sort of like go down the tree, yes, no questions, you know, until you get to resolve. Um, and I think more and more, um, it's, AI has not always been driven by data. And so you're trying to create an artificial intelligence that's not, not necessarily uh, linked to lots and lots of training data. And I think this idea of machines learning from examples is a little bit closer to what I say machine learning is. There's a lot of overlap, and I think people use them interchangeably a lot. Um, but which, what I think AI is more purely, can the computer have intelligence, even if it's not learned intelligence? Like maybe we could program a computer to be very intelligent, but it didn't learn that on its own. It was just taught by us. And I think some examples also in AI are um, chatbots. So if you're, you know, you're chatting with the AI on the computer, right? That AI may not actually have any machine learning knowledge. Like, it may not have any data. It may just be picking up on keywords. So I think that that's how I would describe the difference. But it's a great question. Yeah. Okay, can we just hold off of yeah. the questions? Yes, we'll go ahead. We need to move on, but we will get back to you. I'm sorry, but we have. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to go right on to the uh, biology part and not spend uh, too long on this part. Um, but uh, my uh, research area is computational biology. And all of the work that I've done in computational biology um, in the last maybe five years has been directed toward machine learning. And I would also motivate this by the data that we have now. Um, and so in 2000, the first human genome was sequenced. And it cost billions of dollars. And it took 10 years. Now, uh, 2018 it costs maybe $1,000 to sequence a human genome. And we've sequenced uh, hundreds of thousands of humans, and also uh, tens of thousands of uh, different species. And um, I, I, I show some of these examples that I've worked on. And so actually, uh, a lot of crop genetics, there are tons and tons of data. So Heinz Ketchup actually paid for, I think, about 100 uh, tomato genomes to be sequenced, because they're interested in making tomatoes sort of bigger and redder and all these things. So there's sort of actually artificial selection going on in a lot of crops. And um, you know, I wanted to understand a sort of genetic basis for that um, using machine learning. Things like a polar bear and the giant panda, um, I was interested for uh, conservation purposes and actually looking at if there's enough diversity, genetic diversity in those populations because they have been declining. Um, and also model organisms um, like Drosophila, which is the, the common fruit fly. Um, and their genetics have been really uh, helpful for humans, actually. 
So there's just tons and tons of data. Um, and I think something that this data can actually tell us are, can we actually learn um, something about machine learning from biology? So, so much of machine learning has been applied to problems like images. So can, actually, can biology actually tell us some of the pros and cons um, about, uh, about, about, about um, machine learning itself? And obviously, you know, we want to uncover new biology from this, right? It doesn't, it doesn't help if we can't actually learn some biology from this data. We're not just sort of exercising these methods and running this randomly. We're trying to learn something. Um, so what does this data look like? Uh, so really, you can think of it as a matrix. So these are the number of individuals um, and the rows and the number of sites along the genome. So 3 billion for humans, sites in the genome, hundreds of thousands of humans. So this is really big data, really, really big data. And even to get here, we had to sequence much, much more data to even get this, this nice data set. So what can we actually learn from this? Um, so I've sort of classified the types of things we can learn from genetic data into two broad categories. There are medical applications um, and um, often which, which genes are associated with different diseases. Often we need to sequence a lot of different uh, model organisms in the process so that we're not trying all these things out on humans. Um, and evolution. And I'll talk a little bit about um, population size changes and especially the relationship with um, conservation efforts, so which species have populations that are declining or increasing, um, and natural selection, so which genes have actually been advantageous for our uh, evolution. So the first application, uh, population sizes. So I'll just uh, talk a little bit about the method here. Um, so we're going to think about the genome as these long, long strings, um, ACGT, and different individuals here. And at every site, these individuals are related by some evolutionary tree. And if we see that that tree is sort of very tall, that often means that um, the individuals are not very closely related and that the population size is very large. But if a bunch of random people are in the population are happen to be very genetically similar, maybe we think the population is small. This is going to give us an idea of um, what, what population size we're looking at. And from a machine learning perspective, what we can do is we kind of think about this as our observed data, and we think about the evolutionary tree as our hidden state. We don't know this. You know, just looking at the data, we have no idea about this. But that's this hidden variable. And um, what hidden markup models uh, attempt to do, which are machine learning method, is to uncover that hidden state. So it's... Um, we can think about it as kind of unsupervised in the sense that we're uncovering some hidden structure in the data. Kind of like we did with that clustering um, approach, we're uncovering this hidden structure. And what can we actually learn from this? Um, so a few examples. Um, this is on humans. And just very briefly to, to show this plot, this is time. And this is the present, actually, on this side. And this is the past. And this is the population size. And so all, um, all humans, uh, uh, all modern humans originated in Africa, and different populations migrated out into um, the Middle East and um, the Europe and Asia and the Americas. And around when these sort of curves start to split is roughly around when that happened. So for population sizes, we can actually tell when populations are, um, when they're the same population and then when they're starting to split into kind of different. And you can see that all of these have a very, um, a, an increase in the recent past. So humans have been increasing, our population size is increasing in the recent past. And we can do this for a couple other um, examples. So here's one for uh, Neanderthal and Denisovan, this is ancient DNA that we've sequenced, ancient archaic humans. And they didn't make it, right? So <laughs> this is their population size at zero um, in the red and the black uh, curves here. So we can actually learn sort of when Neanderthals and Denisovans became extinct. Um, and, and lastly, uh, I'll just show this figure on the great apes. And we can see that for um, gorilla, chimp, um, orangutan, their population sizes in the recent past are becoming very small. And I think that we really need to think about whether there's enough genetic diversity in those populations so that they can be successful going forward. Um, how much time do I have? <laughs> Very close. Okay, I'll just speed through the next part. Um, there's also ways in which we're analyzing natural selection. Um, so this is, you know, if, if 
birds are eating all the green beetles, maybe it's advantageous to become orange. Um, this is the idea of natural selection, and there's been many examples of this in humans as well. And often we're really interested in this because we're interested in uh, genes that maybe make us human. Um, and for this example, I'll just show this figure, we used a deep learning approach, and the input data coming in, in this case I applied it to fruit flies, and then we're trying to predict something like selection or population sizes using this deep learning model. And because the data is very complicated, you really need those layers to actually learn something from this very complicated data set. I think whenever the data sets get very complicated, deep learning is sort of where I would go, where I would go next. Um, and this is just the simulation of it. And um, uh, I'm not going to go through all the results, um, but this, this, the, the main takeaway from this uh, slide is that this unsupervised feature learning in the beginning, learning these layers before we sort of do the whole network, is really what makes our results successful. If that's why deep learning failed in the beginnings, is that people were trying to learn the whole network all at once. You really have to learn it layer by layer. So that's, how, that's what I would take away from this, is that really even in biology, you can't just learn the whole layer all at once. You really have to go layer by layer. Um, and there's all these other problems as well, and I'll just end um, with some uh, uh, time for questions if we have a few. Person playing the video game. Oh, <laughs> yes. oh yeah. So um, I can't remember the woman's name, but I saw a talk on YouTube. I think it was a TED talk, and she was from I think Turkey. Very complicated name. She was talking about machine learning and deep learning and these algorithms and how it's changing our politics. And you had brought up, you know, there's a responsibility in there. And one of the things that she said was like she was giving an example of like looking for a YouTube video or Google search where you're given, it seems like the algorithm itself is looking for your edges, right? Like getting more and more specific. And sometimes you get stuff that you don't want to get because it takes you down this path, this feedback loop, and you end up seeing stuff that you like didn't want to see. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you seen this talk? I, I haven't, <laughs> but it sounds possible. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I think my question is about those edges. Like when, like, because you're talking about bias and kind of like um, controlling your input so you have unbiased input. At what point can we insert ourselves into that process so that we, as a human, get back what we want? Because it seems like sometimes they just let it loose, and you've created an animal, and you don't know what that animal's doing out there. <laughs> right, and, and I think that there, there, won't, there won't always be an easy answer for some animals. Right? And I think you know, there's the idea that if we're only getting the training data back, you know, it, as long as it's not too bad, the output won't be too bad. But also if algorithms are kind of starting to learn things that we never saw or we never even experienced, that it's something to think about for sure. Um, and I think that my, I think from my perspective, it needs to be at the data collection stage as well as the algorithm implementation stage and the analysis phase. And that those need to be done before it you know, goes out into the world. And it's not always easy because sometimes going out into the world is how you get that data back, uh, you know, get that training data. Um, but I think it needs to be carefully monitored. And I think that, I don't have any easy answers, but I think in, you know, I'm in the computer science department, we don't really have any like ethics courses or anything like that that we're teaching our students. And those are often the people that are, um, you know, implementing and doing a lot of that, that work. And I think more education there would be really helpful. Too, because I think it's sometimes on the, the end. The input data, people are kind of thinking about it a lot, and the interpreting the output, people can kind of realize that. But sort of in the middle is where we need a little bit more education. This is kind of a follow-up question. So, that, so the algorithm that's doing that, is that learning live? Is like, oh, often, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah for so sure. I'm yeah, like a yeah. user, and yeah. all of a sudden, like, I become this thing that is kind of... It's learning from you. And yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right, what you click on, yeah. what you do. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and... and uh, Facebook definitely, you know, I see it in my own sort of feed and the things that it's showing me, the things that are changing, right? And, you know, you almost want to remove yourself from that. And I think in computer security is another area that needs to interact with this in terms of privacy preferences. Am I going to allow my data to be used to learn, learn things, uh, have the computer learn things? And I think that, that would also be another piece of this, right? Because you have to be able to remove yourself at some point, I think. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, moving along, let's hold the uh, applause until the end. Uh, Rika is going to uh, present next. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Rika Daniel Weiner from 
Distillery and we're an ad tech company and I hope what we're doing will become more clear once I'm through with this presentation. Um, my background is in psychology, experimental psychology, fMRI processing, um, neuroscience, and then two years ago I ended up in um, I'm going to start with an example that we'll have to update very soon. Um, <laughs> This is how much attention where people were paying um, during the last Super Bowl. So you can see the attention curve here at the towing costs going up each time something interesting happened. Went up right before halftime. Nobody was paying attention. Halftime, actually, really, everybody was there. And all the touchdowns obviously caught a lot of attention. So what you should be asking yourself right now is how did you know that? Um, and to do that, I'm going to have to go a little bit back into um, the background of programmatic advertising, which is what we're doing. So we start off with roughly 300 million US consumers. Um, that's all of you. <laughs> and you're using all of your devices to interact with content on the internet. And what you see here is this little blue square which is um, a space that the content provider, this website, has reserved for ads. Um, if you're using an ad blocker, there will be nothing here. Otherwise, an ad will show up. And I will show you how that ad ends up there. So at the time you're arriving at that website, it is unclear yet which <coughs> ad will be shown. That is determined based on you. Um, so once the content provider sees your cookie showing up there, um, it sends all the information that it has about you, which is usually an anonymized ID, um, to a couple of ad exchanges. There are several out there in the world. Um, they are basically the brokers. They tell everybody in the system, us in this case, um, hey, there's an ad. Do you want to bid on this space? Do you want to display your ad on this space? And we're getting about 100 billion bid requests per day. So we are also in a relationship with a couple of different clients, in this example, Chobani. Um, and Chobani has asked us to place their ad. So if we determine that this person, whoever went here, is a good candidate for Chobani, within 100 milliseconds we decide to bid on that space, like you bid on eBay. And um, if we win the bid, um, the ad is going to be displayed there. Uh, and hopefully that ends up in the customer, the consumer interacting with the brand, however you define Inter uh, interaction, that's what we're getting paid for. So, back to this. Um, how do I know? What do you do when you don't pay attention to the TV? Fiddle with your phone, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> attention is diverted by in this case. This is the bid request reduction compared to the big weekend before. Um, this is obviously not what we're getting paid for, but it's a fun side project. <laughs> uh, we were actually sitting there and labeling these events, um, so we were working. Okay, so what we are getting paid for is making this happen. And um, how do we do that? So what we're getting paid for is efficient media delivery, optimizing our audience, finding the right people to display the ads to. Um, what we know is from our 1 billion bit requests every day, we store the cookie on our end and then we gather information um, about that cookie. Which websites has it been on? On which Wi-Fi has it been seen um, together with a certain phone? Which website has that phone been at? Which apps are being used by that phone and where is that phone seen in the physical world? And in the end, we also know what we want. So we have all of that information, what do we do with it? Um, we build a model. Um, Sarah talked about balancing the data set. So here we have, for this example, we have 217 positives and roughly 10, 10 times as many negatives. Um, obviously, that is not the proportion on how our conversion rate actually works. So this is downsampled negatives. Um, we're getting 360,000 features. Which, is, which are all the things that, we, that I talked about before, mainly the content that um, a device has been seen on before, and we're running these simple logistic regressions. Um, 
So, sounds good. Does it work? Um, what you see here is the number of browsers that we see in um, one segment. Um, each of these tabs is a segment, it's a group of people. And then on the y-axis, you see the list over RON. RON is run of network, meaning how much, how many conversions would you have gotten if you had just like randomly presented the ad to anybody in the world. So um, you see here these little blue dots. I've labeled them retargeting. Um, that's the pair of shoes that follows you around the internet. So you've already shown interest in this specific thing. Um, and those tend to work very well, but they don't expand your brand's audience at all. Because it's only people who have already shown interest. The black dots are our, our models, what we call branded audiences. You see a roughly 10 times lift over on. So it's 10 times more probable that somebody from these segments will convert on the brand. And then you see these third party apps. These are um, segments that are being sold and they on average don't tend to work as well. But they're really good. Okay, so nice list. Um, people in these audiences are more probable to buy the product. Now, take a look at the dark side. Can you imagine what I mean by that? <laughs> um, I was talking about we are getting paid for conversions. So what a conversion is defined by the brand. Um, I will try to look good on whatever metric you want to measure me on. And using this much data, I can look good on whatever metric you're deciding to measure me on. Um, so if you decide to measure me on who clicks on the ad, it's a good idea on my end to put that ad onto a flashlight app. Flashlight apps have insane clicks through rates. People are fumbling in the dark, they'll click on your ad. Um, <laughs> might be not what a brand wants. Um, so there are better measures, and as a brand, you have to make really sure you know what you actually want us to do, and you have to communicate that to us. Um, the other thing is here we have a plot of conversion rates, and we're being asked to show ads to the best audience, and I found the best audience is heavy path purchasers. If I show an ad to any of these guys, um, there's only one problem. If you also show them a PSA, which is a public service announcement, please donate money to breast cancer, it's still the, sa oops, it's still the same guys that are going to buy. Um, so in the end, you might have lost some of your money that you were spending on ads. Even though we, we showed ads to the people who ended up buying. Um, so now the question is, it is important to actually run A-B test, but in this case, it's also obvious that the creative wasn't as, wasn't really much better than the public service announcement, meaning that that creative did not resonate. That's not, our targeting was on spot, but the creative just didn't do anything. So now, we need to start rethinking programmatic and start thinking about how we can use all of this wealth of data that I was talking about here, not just to find the people who will convert, but to understand the people, who they are, and how to talk to them. And considering that I have pretty much the complete website visitation history of a cookie, if you didn't delete your cookie, um, then that is a rich wealth of information that we can offer. Um, so back to here. We can figure out what makes these guys special and how can we talk to them. And here we go into unsupervised learning. Um, as Sarah was talking before, it is really easy to build a model and tell the model, tell me who these red guys are. But what we're now having is we're having a diverse group of people going to the website or doing whatever conversion events they're defining. And we're telling the machine, show us natural segments within there. Um, and then we can look um, whether how we can figure out to, how to talk to them. There's only one problem with that. Um, if you have a complex website reputation history, 
You can see here this one guy went to a lot of bird watching websites and the New York Times. This person went to a lot of cosmetics related websites and the New York Times. And then this grandma here also went to a lot of bird watching websites and the New York Times. Everybody goes to the New York Times. Um, that's not a very predictive feature of anything. But we would actually like our algorithm to tell us that this guy was similar to this person. Even though these websites, they are all about bird watching. We can tell that, but um, the computer doesn't know if we just tell them this is your input. So we were starting to think, well, maps give us context. If I just give you a map of the world and um, tell you these are cities, um, then you will not know anything about them. But if I tell you, well, these are all cities on the east coast of the USA, these are all east coast, west coast of the USA, these are all cities on the east coast of the USA, you will know what to expect, what type of behavior to expect from these types of people. Um, so we went ahead and mapped the websites that are the top 50,000 content websites um, that we have in our system that explains, I think, about 95% of all website traffic. Um, and just gave them to a computer to learn using deep learning methods. We were, um, we were learning in which sequence these websites are usually visited together. So the algorithm was slowly learning which websites to group together. In each pass, um, the websites are moving closer together. And then we employed some clustering methods to actually come up with this sort of map where you can see websites that are off. So maybe that's something um, the Brad can work with. So here we see two, two consumer segments that we uncovered for a different brand, Chaban Yugen. We saw that um, their consumers are gym enthusiasts and quick service restaurant customers. Those are two very different groups, and maybe you need to learn to talk separately or differently to them. Um, so we have the self-improve, uh, so you have a couple of different messages here um, that Giovanni was testing out. Um, and we were looking at how does this message actually resonate in terms of compared to a PSA actually lifting sales. Um, and we're seeing here that we have three different uh, quick service restaurants. And for these guys, the delicious, dive into deliciousness message really resonated well. Versus if we look at the, um, uh, at the gym enthusiast brand, we're seeing here um, that um, the self-improvement message really resonated very well with them. So there's a dark side to this too, and no worries if you don't get the Schrodinger's cat example. But um, when you, whenever you're experimenting with a system, you're changing it, right? So especially if you design that experiment to actually then deliver specific types of ads to the specific types of people. So we always, we will change the system that we're working in and the system will be changed by time. Um, as Sarah said, we can only use our algorithms on past data. If the times have changed, we will need to update the data. So you always need to listen, test, then activate, and then measure again and listen again. And that's basically an endless circle that has to always go on. Any questions? No? OK, then uh, OK, answer. Can you talk about the skill sets that are needed in order to do that kind of work and be able to do that? You need to be able to employ mathematical algorithms in an environment that's maybe not standardized. So that basically means Python on the command line or R or whatever language you feel comfortable in. Um, there are people at our company that work with different skill sets there. Um, what you also will need to be able to do is to talk to the client to figure out what type of information is useful for them. So I'm a fairly technically minded person <laughs> and I get excited about specific results and then I go to the client and I tell them, look what we found, isn't that interesting? <laughs> and the client's like, yeah, but <laughs> so you have to go back and like 
adjust what you're um, what you're delivering, and you'll also be need, need to be able to talk to um, even more technically minded people to actually then implement this into production. Thank you, Mika. So Sima, please uh, join us. Thank you. That was very insightful. <laughs> I learned a lot, so thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Seema Thomas, and my slides did not make it in this technical world, so I will be having an interactive uh, conversation with you all. So a little bit about me, what do I do? Um, I'm part, I work for a company called SAP, it's a German company, and uh, our core business is to create applications for businesses. Companies. 40 years old this year, and it started with creating uh, business applications for financial services. And at that time, the company came up with larger monolithic applications called Enterprise Resource Planning Systems. So basically, um, uh, any company could create their sales orders, they could create their advertising and marketing and campaign plan, they could book the sales that they did, and also feed that data into their manufacturing plan to be able to figure out how much of product do you need to build based upon what was sold. So all those different business units could keep the data in one system. That was a game changer, but that, that was 30 years ago, right? So those monolithic applications are no longer working today. They're working, but they're working in the background, right? So uh, uh, what is that organization doing today to take those big applications so they work for you as well as they work for the manufacturing organization in the background, as well as they help the advertising marketing organizations to figure out how to fine tune the message that reaches each and every one of you on a very individual basis. Because you're looking at your cell phones even when you're watching TV. If you notice when you're watching TV, a lot of TV anchors have their cell phone with them, right? So the dynamics, our social dynamics have changed and the, the ability of businesses to be able to reach you at any given point anywhere in the world on any device is available today. My daughter is as old as some of you. She studies at Villanova, but I learned about artificial intelligence in my computer engineering course way back when. So these technologies are not new, but they were not commercial at that time. They are commercial today, as you saw in the examples that Taylor shared in her re uh, from her research work and wake up what you're applying to be able to make use of the information that is available for all of us right now. The data that got created in the last five years is way more than the data that was ever created in this world, and it is here to stay, like you heard. And now what are we going to do with it? Data is the fuel that is going to guide our lives going forward. But fuel needs to be refined, right? You need to make some method into the madness that we are having in terms of bulk of data. And that is the core of making changes into the business applications so they work for today's world. And I will start with making a connection with what Rekha shared in terms of advertising, gaining information from what people are doing online at, at any given time. So we have a solution. It is referred to as CRM, Customer Relationship Management Solution. <coughs> Have you heard of a solution like that, right? So now, Customer Relationship Management is evolved because customers don't want to be managed. They want to be engaged. You want to talk to the company from where you're buying shoes or t-shirt or a tank because you want to know you are an informed buyer. You are an informed purchaser. By the time you walk into a shop or in a conversation to buy anything, 57% of the decision is already made before you interact with the salesperson or in the sales process. Research shows that, right? So now, how are you going to leverage the data that is already existing in your system and combine that with the social data that you're connecting from different social channels? So if I'm selling tanks or I'm selling shoes, 
I want to know that. I have information about my customers. That data looks like name, first name, last name. I'm sure you're all used to adding that information. What is your address? What is your phone number? Now some, some may ask what is your LinkedIn profile and what is your Twitter handle, right? It is because they're browsing information about you as a customer to figure out what is the best product that we can sell you, leveraging the advertising space that is on your that, that source, right? So uh, we have a new solution that is focused on creating that web storefront. You buy stuff from the grocery store, you buy stuff from <coughs> Dior or Chanel store in New York or wherever, and now you have another channel. You have same products that are on your screen. It could be this big, this big, and this big, right? So what is the, as a seller, what is the most effective way to put that information in front of you that catches your attention, that catches your attention, and that catches your attention? And believe me, you like red shoes, you like black shoes, and you like different color shoe. So the system has to know that to be able to come up with that recommendation. How is that going to happen? As you are purchasing products from whether it is Zappos or whether it is um, Adidas store or Foot Locker, each and every vendor is gathering information on you so they can serve you effectively. How are you doing that? They are deploying the algorithms that are available into their storefront. So the algorithm is collecting data that is coming on from one side, refining it, and coming up with recommendations for you, for you, and for you, based upon your past purchase history. Also, based upon the live information that is coming in about what product did you look at, how long were you on that product? Did you click on that product to see the details and price of that? Did you put that product in your cart? And did you actually buy it? Or did you abandon the cart? All of that information is getting captured by that storefront. And I was fascinated. I've been working in this for some time. But I was late to the game uh, of purchasing stuff online. And I have a story here. My daughter wanted to buy those Ugg shoes way back when, right? Before Christmas, mom, I want gray Ugg shoes. And I'm like, what Ugg shoes? I mean, what is that? I'm Indian. I'm a little late to fashion. I'm a little late to figure out what the teenagers wanted, right? So it is four days before Christmas, and I'm like, OK, I'm going to buy shoes uh, for her. And I use Zappos. Shoes arrive on time. Everything worked great. Next year, same thing, and I'm late. So guess what? I go back to Zappos, and I said, that website worked for me last year. They had my purchase history, not only from last year, but through the year. So they knew what I was looking for. And, um, and when I looked at my past purchases, I was fascinated. So this is a few years ago. Now they know more about me. They not only know that I buy for my daughter because of Ugg shoes I'm not wearing. They know how old I am. Right? <laughs> so, and they also know that I buy my daughter's soccer shoes and running shoes. So the recommendations that come for me are different than the ones that are going to come for my daughter. So it is learning. It's a constant learning that is happening there and it is coming up with recommendations. And I know you had a question, somebody had a question here about what's the difference with artificial learning and how do you come up with correct recommendations because if you're analyzing past data, then you're going you're gonna to come up with the same results because you have the same pattern. Now, if as an organization I have come up with a new product that may not be similar to what we made before, but the, the system is telling me that it will be a good fit for you, maybe I can create a simulation scenario. I, in the past, you bought these five types of products. What happens if I introduce the sixth product? Will I have a conversion rate that will take this product from recommendation to final sale? And that is how you can combine what the system is telling you with external stimuli to see what you can achieve in terms of new business and new product launch. And then the system will learn and come back with recommendations that this product is doing well, make more of it, or this product is not doing well, 
kill it, write it off, move on. So it is helping businesses figure out what is the right product to continue to make and what is the right match for that product from consumer perspective. So it is a direct machine learning application in today's world and these applications are there right now. Another example is, is when you, uh, these websites or web storefronts are getting created, they come up with a recommendation. What products should go in front? What products should go on the side? What products should go in the back? Thank you. How many of you shop in grocery stores? You know that what they want you to buy is on the, always at the aisle level, right? So now, same web storefronts are, uh, same uh, uh, methodologies are being applied to web storefronts. I'll go to the second example. I got carried away with consumer. Um, uh, I got so excited with the data that you saw. Second example, HR. So in our organization, there are 80,000 employees. And the, the number of employees that are joining the workforce within SAP, it is growing. So if you're in HR, you want to see what is the profile of the folks who joined in last year? Are we hiring the same profile that is there? Now you're talking about a global company that has offices in 20 different countries from Asia to um, uh, uh, EMEA, that is Europe, Africa, Latin America, North America. What is the profile we are hiring? Are we hiring young people? Are we hiring women? Are we hiring um, uh, computer engineers? Are we hiring uh, psychologists because it is, a, or are we hiring folks from business and arts? What is the combination? What is the profile? What are, what is the retention rate? That is all coming from the data that is existing in the system. It is internal system within the company. Then there are also um, algorithms that are available that read the employee response. I'm sure, who, how many of you are in workforce? You receive employee surveys, right? Based upon that, it can assess what is the employee engagement rate. So you figure out what is my employee retention rate, and if there is a problem, what are the recommended action items? So either you deploy the recommended action, action items, or you can change them and come up with a strategy to improve employee engagement, and that could be different for different country, different office, different business unit, different product line. Because in US, there are a lot of sales and support but in Germany, we have a lot of research and development. So the profile that is required for each office or each business unit is different. So recommendations are going to be different. And it is very difficult for a human brain to process that much of data. So guess what? It is machine learning prediction and recommendation that is being used. And these are the same systems that are being created by our organization, uh, the 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 product is called success factors and this is what we are actually selling to our business to our customers as well Sec the third thing is how do we retrain now the, the the employees have joined our organization how do we make sure that they know what they know because technology changes like you were asking so what skill set do you need you're going to need a skill set to start working in a field today but guess what you're going to you're going to need to refresh that skill set to be relevant for tomorrow's technology. So how is HR going to make sure that workforce in a company is relevant for tomorrow's business? Because businesses have to stay relevant. So they're going to create training courses. And when you are logging into your HR profile, guess what? Your training courses recommendations are going to come based upon what level you are, what, are your, what is your existing skill set, and where do you want to go. So. Ladies, whoever are getting into the workforce, document what you want to be tomorrow. Whether you want to be a manager, whether you want to be a vice president, whether you want to be in research, because based upon where you want to go, your training courses are going to be coming as a recommendation. Very similar to the recommendation that you get in Netflix. <laughs> right? What you watch and what you want to watch, that recommendation is coming from your past behavior. And same way, what, you, what shoes you bought and the new shoes that are going to come as a recommendation, they are, gonna, they are coming from learning. So, so these are a couple of areas and uh, there is really one application of machine learning 
that our company is uh, experimenting with, is uh, are working with, it's in prototype, so there's a robot. We talked about chatbot, and that's when I thought I had to talk about it. That robot is made in Japan, and her name is Pepper. She has eyes, it looks like a robot, but she's so cute, and I have such a soft spot. So the <laughs> robot has wheels, all right? So, it, the, right, and it has an iPad. So when you walk in, it'll move its face. Hello, how may I help you? But on the iPad is a picture of all the products. So if you're walking into a shoe store, it's going to have shoes. So you can say, can you help me with those shoes? Or if I do not speak that language, I can click. And then it will learn what I'm looking for products. So either it will, it will show me the product selection, if I say apples or whatever, it's going to show me all the apples, the red ones, the green ones, the Granny Smith ones, and Gawa apples, all of them here. The same interface is available as a messenger. Uh, it's called Charlie the Chatbot on my phone where I can text in natural language processing what I'm looking for. So I say apples and they're all there and it is, it is in a messenger format. I'm not at a web storefront. So this is the next wave of all of you engaging with any brand at any time, anywhere, with, with your territory. Because all the, at the end of the day, businesses are in the business of doing business. So it is impacting trade. It is impacting engagement. It is impacting the channel of communication and the way it is um, the businesses are able to do that is leveraging machine learning algorithms so you have an effective experience in engaging with the brands and brands have an effective sales channel that works for all. So that's all that I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Let's What is your way of staying up to date on skills? So what's your favorite way to learn new um, skills or new information or keep up with all of this like exciting change that's happening in modern living? I get sad. I talk to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding you not. It's, it's, I, I learn from her. And when I'm teaching here, I learn as much from my students as they do from me. Because um, how the younger generation, how you all are using technology, is totally different than the way I use technology. You know, how, I, I, how stressed I get when anybody asks me for my address and phone number so they could send me some coupons. <laughs> it, it's, it's a different mindset. So, so um, I. I do, I do have a conversation with other folks to see what they're doing. Second thing that I like to learn from is this online courses. God, I don't have that much of time to go sit in a class that is three days and you pay so much money. It used to be, that used to happen. Believe me. So nowadays there are a lot more 15 minutes or five minutes courses, videos that are available and that helps a lot. And that helps a lot. Another thing that I stay focused on is, is there's a lot of information when I need to figure out what helps me do my job. Because if you saw Karen in keynote saying, stay focused who you, who you, who you want your mentor to be and you can't have 15 mentors. You, you have to focus on what you're doing. So even though you want to grow, but it has to be relevant to what you're doing. So prioritize and then figure out what you want to learn. So that that's what I do. Yeah, I, I would also echo that in terms of doing the tutorials. Um, and I, I, as an example, so the method that I mentioned, the deep learning method, I implemented that in Java. And, you know, I've been hearing all about TensorFlow, and I actually switched all my research over to TensorFlow recently. And I just, I did the tutorial, you just kind of have to jump in somewhere, and um, just to kind of keep up to date. I'd also re recommend uh, Hacker News. Um, it has a lot of articles across the tech spectrum, uh, spectrum, 
And um, just to kind of stay up to date, if you kind of see that people are talking about R, if you're talking about Python, you know, what are the what are those skills that you want to kind of pull out and do? Just do the online tutorial. Just force yourself to do it, and then you will feel like, oh, I know R now. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Talking to people, you'll pick up those keywords. And by talking, I also mean just reading people's blogs. Um, and you'll find the topics that you're interested in and then just Google and read Google is our friend. <laughs> um, another thing that I would recommend is with analysts. I, I know everybody has a different thought process, but Gardner, Aberdeen, uh, Forrester, they publish annual research on what are the technology trends, um, what are the different companies, Magic Quadrant and Forrester Waves, they help. At least I'm in technology, so that helps me to figure out where everybody is and where the, the industry is going and where my competitors are going and what are the newcomers because whoever are today's big solidified organizations, there's no guarantee they're going to stay there. So, you, so they give you a pretty good information of who are the newcomers and what are the new startups and, and what is happening in the marketplace. So that helps a lot. And some of those are, you have to buy them, but if you, uh, there are some memberships, student memberships or whatever, so that helps a lot too. Thank you. Let's thank again.